Section one of the Shipwreck of the Whale Ship Essex by Owen Chase. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Narrative of the most extraordinary and distressing shipwreck of the whale ship Essex of Nantucket which was attacked and finally destroyed by a large spermaceti whale in the pacific ocean with an account of the unparalleled sufferings of the captain and crew during a space of ninety-three days at sea in open boats in the years eighteen nineteen and eighteen twenty by owen chase of nantucket first mate of said vessel to the reader i am aware that the public mind has been already nearly sated with the private stories of individuals many of whom had few if any claims to public attention and the injuries which have resulted from the promulgation of fictitious histories and in many instances of journals entirely fabricated for the purpose has had the effect to lessen the public interest in works of this description and very much to undervalue the general cause of truth it is however not the less important and necessary that narratives should continue to be furnished that have their foundations in fact and the subject of which embraces new and interesting matter in any department of the arts or sciences when the motive is worthy the subject and style interesting affording instruction exciting a proper sympathy and with all disclosing new and astonishing traits of human character this kind of information becomes of great value to the philanthropist and philosopher and is fully deserving of attention from every description of readers on the subject of the facts contained in this little volume they are neither so extravagant as to require the exercise of any great credulity to believe nor i trust so unimportant or uninteresting as to forbid an attentive perusal it was my misfortune to be a considerable if not a principal sufferer in the dreadful catastrophe that befell us and in it i not only lost all the little i had ventured but my situation and the prospects of bettering it that at one time seemed to smile upon me were all in one short moment destroyed with it the hope of obtaining something of remuneration by giving a short history of my sufferings to the world must therefore constitute my claim to public attention End of section one. Section two of the shipwreck of the whale ship Essex by Owen Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Chapter one. The outbound voyage. The town of Nantucket in the state of Massachusetts contains about eight thousand inhabitants nearly a third part of the population are quakers and they are taken together a very industrious and enterprising people on this island are owned about one hundred vessels of all descriptions engaged in the whaling trade giving constant employment and support to upwards of sixteen hundred hardy seamen a class of people proverbial for their intrepidity this fishery is not carried on to any extent from any other part of the united states except from the town of new bedford directly opposite to nantucket where are owned probably twenty sail a voyage generally lasts about two years and a half and with an entire uncertainty of success sometimes they are repaid with speedy voyages and profitable cargoes and at others they drag out a listless and disheartening cruise without scarcely making the expenses of an outfit the business is considered a very hazardous one arising from unavoidable accidents in carrying on and exterminating warfare against those great leviathans of the deep and indeed a nantucket man is on all occasions fully sensible of the honor and merit of his profession no doubt because he knows that his laurels like the soldiers are plucked from the brink of danger numerous anecdotes are related of the whalemen of nantucket and stories of hair-breadth scapes and sudden and wonderful preservation are handed down amongst them with the fidelity and no doubt many of them with the characteristic fictions of the ancient legendary tales a spirit of adventure amongst the sons of other relatives of those immediately concerned in it takes possession of their minds at a very early age captivated with the tough stories of the elder seamen 
and seduced as well by the natural desire of seeing foreign countries as by the hopes of gain they launch forth six or eight thousand miles from home into an almost untraversed ocean and spend from two to three years of their lives in scenes of constant peril labor and watchfulness the profession is one of great ambition and full of honorable excitement a tame man is never known amongst them and the coward is marked with that peculiar aversion that distinguishes our public naval service there are perhaps no people of superior corporeal powers and it has been truly said of them that they possess a natural aptitude which seems rather the lineal spirit of their fathers than the effects of any experience the town itself during the war was naturally to have been expected on the decline but with the return of peace it took a fresh start and a spirit for carrying on the fishery received a renewed and very considerable excitement large capitals are now embarked and some of the finest ships that our country can boast of are employed in it the increased demand within a few years past from the spermaceti manufactories has induced companies and individuals in different parts of the union to become engaged in the business and if the future consumption of the manufactured articles bear any proportion to that of the few past years this species of commerce will bid fair to become the most profitable and extensive that our country possesses from the accounts of those that were in the early stages of the fishery concerned in it it would appear that the whales have been driven like the beasts of the forest before the march of civilization into remote and more unfrequented seas until now they are followed by the enterprise and perseverance of our seamen even to the distant coasts of japan the ship essex commanded by captain george paulin jr was fitted out at nantucket and sailed on the twelfth day of august eighteen nineteen for the pacific ocean on a whaling voyage of this ship i was first mate she had lately undergone a thorough repair in her upper works and was at that time in all respects a sound substantial vessel she had a crew of twenty-one men and was victualled and provided for two years and a half we left the coast of america with a fine breeze and steered for the western islands on the second day out while sailing moderately on our course in the gulf stream a sudden squall of wind struck the ship from the southwest and knocked her completely on her beam ends stove one of our boats entirely destroyed two others and threw down the camboose we distinctly saw the approach of this gust but miscalculated altogether as to the strength and violence of it it struck the ship about three points off the weather quarter at the moment that the man at the helm was in the act of putting her away to run before it in an instant she was knocked down with her yards in the water and before hardly a moment of time was allowed for reflection she gradually came to the wind and righted the squall was accompanied with vivid flashes of lightning and heavy and repeated claps of thunder the whole ship's crew were for a short time thrown into the utmost consternation and confusion but fortunately the violence of the squall was all contained in the first gust of the wind and it soon gradually abated and became fine weather again we repaired our damage with little difficulty and continued on our course with the loss of the two boats on the thirtieth of august we made the island of floros one of the western group called the azores we lay off and on the island for two days during which time our boats landed and obtained the supply of vegetables and a few hogs from this place we took the northeast trade wind and in sixteen days made the isle of may one of the cape de verde as we were sailing along the shore of this island we discovered a ship stranded on the beach and from her appearance took her to be a whaler having lost two of our own boats and presuming that this vessel had probably some belonging to her that might have been saved we determined to ascertain the name of the ship and endeavored to supply if possible the loss of our boats from her we accordingly stood in towards the port or landing place after a short time three men were discovered coming out to us in a whale boat in a few moments they were alongside and informed us that the wreck was the archimedes of new york captain george b coffin 
which vessel had struck on a rock near the island about a fortnight previously that all hands were saved by running the ship on shore and that the captain and crew had gone home we purchased the whale-boat of these people obtained some few more pigs and again set sail our passage thence to cape horn was not distinguished for any incident worthy of note we made the longitude of the cape about the eighteenth of december having experienced head winds for nearly the whole distance we anticipated a moderate time in passing this noted land from the season of the year at which we were there being considered the most favourable but instead of this we experienced heavy westerly gales and a most tremendous sea that detained us off the cape five weeks before we got sufficiently to the westward to enable us to put away on the passage of this famous cape it may be observed that strong westerly gales and a heavy sea are its almost universal attendants the prevalence and constancy of this wind and sea necessarily produce a rapid current by which vessels are set to leeward and it is not without some favourable slant of wind that they can in many cases get round at all the difficulties and dangers of the passage are proverbial but as far as my own observation extends and which the numerous reports of the whalemen corroborate you can always rely upon a long and regular sea and although the gales may be very strong and stubborn as they undoubtedly are they are not known to blow with the destructive violence that characterizes some of the tornadoes of the western atlantic ocean on the seventeenth of january eighteen twenty we arrived at the island of st mary's lying on the coast of chile in the latitude thirty six degrees fifty nine minutes south longitude seventy three degrees forty one minutes west this island is a sort of rendezvous for whalers from which they obtain their wood and water and between which and the mainland a distance of about ten miles they frequently cruise for a species of whale called the right whale our object in going there was merely to get the news we sailed thence to the island of massafuera where we got some wood and fish and thence for the cruising ground along the coast of chile in search of the spermaceti whale we took there eight which yielded us two hundred and fifty barrels of oil and the season having by this time expired we changed our cruising ground to the coast of peru we obtained there five hundred and fifty barrels after going into the small port of decimus and replenishing our wood and water on the second october we set sail for the galapagos islands we came to anchor and laid seven days off hood's island one of the group during which time we stopped a leak which we had discovered and obtained three hundred turtle we then visited charles island where we procured sixty more these turtle are a most delicious food and average in weight generally about one hundred pounds but many of them weigh upwards of eight hundred with these ships usually supply themselves for a great length of time and make a great saving of other provisions they neither eat nor drink nor is the least pains taken with them they are strewed over the deck thrown under foot or packed away in the hold as it suits convenience they will live upwards of a year without food or water but soon die in a cold climate we left charles island on the twenty third of october and steered off to the westward in search of whales in latitude one degree zero minutes south longitude one hundred and eighteen degrees west on the sixteenth of november in the afternoon we lost a boat during our work in a shoal of whales i was in the boat myself with five others and was standing in the forepart with the harpoon in my hand well braced expecting every instant to catch sight of one of the shoal which we were in that i might strike but judge of my astonishment and dismay at finding myself suddenly thrown up in the air my companions scattered about me and the boat fast filling with water a whale had come up directly under her and with one dash of his tail had stove her bottom in and strewed us in every direction around her we however with little difficulty got safely on the wreck and clung there until one of the other boats which had been engaged in the shoal came to our assistance and took us off strange to tell not a man was injured by this accident thus it happens very frequently in the whaling business that the boats are stove 
oars harpoons and lines broken ankles and wrists sprained boats upset and whole crews left for hours in the water without any of these accidents extending to the loss of life we are so much accustomed to the continual recurrence of such scenes as these that we become familiarized to them and consequently always feel that confidence and self-possession which teaches us every expedient in danger and inures the body as well as the mind to fatigue privation and peril in frequent cases exceeding belief it is this danger and hardship that makes the sailor indeed it is the distinguishing qualification amongst us and is a common boast to the whaleman that he has escaped from sudden and apparently inevitable destruction oftener than his fellows he is accordingly valued on this account without much reference to other qualities end of section two three of the shipwreck of the whale ship essex by owen chase this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schempf. chapter two the wreck i have not been able to recur to the scenes which are now to become the subject of description although a considerable time has elapsed without feeling a mingled emotion of horror and astonishment at the almost incredible destiny that has preserved me and my surviving companions from a terrible death frequently in my reflections on the subject even after this lapse of time i find myself shedding tears of gratitude for our deliverance and blessing god by whose divine aid and protection we were conducted through a series of unparalleled suffering and distress and restored to the bosoms of our families and friends there is no knowing what a stretch of pain and misery the human mind is capable of contemplating when it is wrought upon by the anxieties of preservation nor what pangs and weaknesses the body is able to endure until they are visited upon it and when at last deliverance comes when the dream of hope is realized unspeakable gratitude takes possession of the soul and tears of joy choke the utterance we require to be taught in the school of some signal suffering privation and despair the great lessons of constant dependence upon an almighty forbearance and mercy in the midst of the wide ocean at night when the sight of the heavens was shut out and the dark tempest came upon us then it was that we felt ourselves ready to exclaim heaven have mercy upon us for naught but that can save us now but i proceed to the recital on the twentieth of november cruising in latitude zero degrees forty minutes south longitude one hundred nineteen degrees zero minutes west a shoal of whales was discovered off the lee bow the weather at this time was extremely fine and clear and it was about eight o'clock in the morning that a man at the masthead gave the usual cry of there she blows the ship was immediately put away and we ran down in the direction for them when we had got within a half mile of the place where they were observed all our boats were lowered down manned and we started in pursuit of them the ship in the meantime was brought back to the wind and the main topsail hove aback to wait for us i had the harpoon in the second boat the captain preceded me in the first when i arrived at the spot where we calculated they were nothing was at first to be seen we lay on our oars in anxious expectation of discovering them come up somewhere near us presently one rose and spouted a short distance ahead of my boat i made all speed towards it came up with and struck it feeling the harpoon in him he threw himself in an agony over towards the boat which at that time was up alongside of him and giving a severe blow with his tail struck the boat near the edge of the water amidships and stove a hole in her i immediately took up the boat hatchet and cut the line to disengage the boat from the whale which by this time was running off with great velocity i succeeded in getting clear of him with the loss of the harpoon and line and finding the water to pour fast in the boat i hastily stuffed three or four of our jackets in the hole ordered one man to keep constantly bailing and the rest to pull immediately for the ship we succeeded in keeping the boat free and shortly gained the ship the captain and the second mate in the other two boats kept up the pursuit and soon struck another whale 
they being at this time a considerable distance to leeward i went forward braced about the mainyard and put the ship off in a direction for them the boat which had been stove was immediately hoisted in and after examining the whole i found that i could by nailing a piece of canvas over it get her ready to join in a fresh pursuit sooner than by lowering down the other remaining boat which belonged to the ship i accordingly turned her over upon the quarter and was in the act of nailing on the canvas when i observed a very large spermaceti whale as well as i could judge about eighty-five feet in length he broke water about twenty rods off our weather bow and was lying quietly with his head in the direction for the ship he spouted two or three times and then disappeared in less than two or three seconds he came up again about the length of the ship off and made directly for us at the rate of about three knots the ship was then going with about the same velocity his appearance and attitude gave us at first no alarm but while i stood watching his movements and observing him but a ship's length off coming down for us with great celerity i involuntarily ordered the boy at the helm to put it hard up intending to sheer off and avoid him the words were scarcely out of my mouth before he came down upon us with full speed and struck the ship with his head just forward of the fore chains he gave us such an appalling and tremendous jar as nearly threw us all on our faces the ship brought up as suddenly and violently as if she had struck a rock and trembled for a few seconds like a leaf we looked at each other with perfect amazement deprived almost of the power of speech many minutes elapsed before we were able to realize the dreadful accident during which time he passed under the ship grazing her keel as he went along came up alongside of her to leeward and lay on the top of the water apparently stunned with the violence of the blow for the space of a minute he then suddenly started off in a direction to leeward after a few moments reflection and recovering in some measure from the sudden consternation that had seized us i of course concluded that he had stove a hole in the ship and that it would be necessary to set the pumps going accordingly they were rigged but had not been in operation more than one minute before i perceived the head of the ship to be gradually settling down in the water i then ordered the signal to be set for the other boats which scarcely had i dispatched before i again discovered the whale apparently in convulsions on top of the water about one hundred rods to leeward he was enveloped in the foam of the sea that his continual and violent thrashing about in the water had created around him and i could distinctly see him smite his jaws together as if distracted with rage and fury he remained a short time in this situation and then started off with great velocity across the bows of the ship to windward by this time the ship had settled down a considerable distance in the water and i gave her up for lost i however ordered the pumps to be kept constantly going and endeavored to collect my thoughts for the occasion i turned to the boats two of which we then had with the ship with an intention of clearing them away and getting all things ready to embark in them if there should be no other resource left and while my attention was thus engaged for a moment i was aroused with the cry of a man at the hatchway here he is he's making for us again i turned around and saw him about one hundred rods directly ahead of us coming down apparently with twice his ordinary speed and to me at that moment it appeared with tenfold fury and vengeance in his aspect the surf flew in all directions about him and his course towards us was marked by a white foam of a rod in width which he made with the continual violent thrashing of his tail his head was about half out of water and in that way he came upon and again struck the ship i was in hopes when i descried him making for us that by a dexterous movement of putting the ship away immediately i should be able to cross the line of his approach before he could get up to us and thus avoid what i knew if he should strike us again would prove our inevitable destruction i bawled out to the helmsman hard up but she had not fallen off more than a point before we took the second shock i should judge the speed of the ship to have been at this time about three knots and that of the whale about six he struck her to windward directly under the cat head and completely stove in her bows he passed under the ship again went off to leeward and we saw no more of him 
our situation at this juncture can be more readily imagined than described the shock to our feelings was such as i am sure none can have an adequate conception of that were not there the misfortune befell us at a moment when we least dreamt of any accident and from the pleasing anticipations we had formed of realizing the certain profits of our labor we were dejected by a sudden most mysterious and overwhelming calamity not a moment however was to be lost in endeavoring to provide for the extremity to which it was now certain we were reduced we were more than a thousand miles from the nearest land and with nothing but a light open boat as the resource of safety for myself and companions i ordered the men to cease pumping and every one to provide for himself seizing a hatchet at the same time i cut away the lashings of the spare boat which lay bottom up across two spars directly over the quarter-deck and cried out to those near me to take her as she came down they did so accordingly and bore her on their shoulders as far as the waist of the ship the steward had in the meantime gone down into the cabin twice and saved two quadrants two practical navigators and the captain's trunk and mine all which were hastily thrown into the boat as she lay on the deck with the two compasses which i snatched from the binnacle he attempted to descend again but the water by this time had rushed in and he returned without being able to effect his purpose by the time we had got the boat to the waist the ship was filled with water and was going down on her beam ends we shoved our boat as quickly as possible from the plank shear into the water all hands jumping in her at the same time and launched off clear of the ship we were scarcely two boat lengths distant from her when she fell over to windward and settled down in the water amazement and despair now wholly took possession of us we contemplated the frightful situation the ship lay in and thought with horror upon the sudden and dreadful calamity that had overtaken us we looked upon each other as if to gather some consolatory sensation from an interchange of sentiments but every countenance was marked with the paleness of despair not a word was spoken for several minutes by any of us all appeared to be bound in a spell of stupid consternation and from the time we were first attacked by the whale to the period of the fall of the ship and of our leaving her in the boat more than ten minutes could not certainly have elapsed god only knows in what way or by what means we were enabled to accomplish in that short time what we did the cutting away and transporting the boat from where she was deposited would of itself in ordinary circumstances have consumed as much time as that if the whole ship's crew had been employed in it my companions had not saved a single article but what they had on their backs but to me it was a source of infinite satisfaction if any such could be gathered from the horrors of our gloomy situation that we had been fortunate enough to have preserved our compasses navigators and quadrants after the first shock of my feelings was over i enthusiastically contemplated them as the probable instruments of our salvation without them all would have been dark and hopeless gracious god what a picture of distress and suffering now presented itself to my imagination the crew of the ship were saved consisting of twenty human souls all that remained to conduct these twenty beings through the stormy terrors of the ocean perhaps many thousand miles were three open light boats the prospect of obtaining any provisions or water from the ship to subsist on during the time was at least now doubtful how many long and watchful nights thought i are to be passed how many tedious days of partial starvation are to be endured before the least relief or mitigation of our sufferings can be reasonably anticipated we lay at this time in our boat about two ship lengths off from the wreck in perfect silence calmly contemplating her situation and absorbed in our own melancholy reflections when the other boats were discovered rowing up to us they had but shortly before discovered that some accident had befallen us but of the nature of which they were entirely ignorant the sudden and mysterious disappearance of the ship was first discovered by the boat steerer in the captain's boat and with a horror-struck countenance and voice he suddenly exclaimed oh my god where is the ship their operations upon this were instantly suspended and a general cry of horror and despair burst from the lips of every man as their looks were directed for her in vain over every part of the ocean 
they immediately made all haste towards us the captain's boat was the first that reached us he stopped about a boat's length off but had no power to utter a single syllable he was so completely overpowered with the spectacle before him that he sat down in his boat pale and speechless i could scarcely recognize his countenance he appeared to be so much altered awed and overcome with the oppression of his feelings and the dreadful reality that lay before him he was in a short time however enabled to address the inquiry to me my god mr chase what is the matter i answered we have been stove by a whale i then briefly told him the story after a few moments reflection he observed that we must cut away her masts and endeavour to get something out of her to eat our thoughts were now all accordingly bent on endeavours to save from the wreck whatever we might possibly want and for this purpose we rowed up and got on to her search was made for every means of gaining access to her hold and for this purpose the lanyards were cut loose and with our hatchets we commenced to cut away the masts that she might right up again and enable us to scuttle her decks in doing which we were occupied about three-quarters of an hour owing to our having no axes nor indeed any other instruments but the small hatchets belonging to the boats after her masts were gone she came up about two-thirds of the way upon an even keel while we were employed about the masts the captain took his quadrant shoved off from the ship and got an observation we found ourselves in latitude zero degrees forty minutes south longitude one hundred and nineteen degrees west we now commenced to cut a hole through the planks directly above two large casks of bread which most fortunately were between decks in the waist of the ship and which being in the upper side when she upset we had strong hopes were not wet it turned out according to our wishes and from these casks we obtained six hundred pounds of hard bread other parts of the deck were then scuttled and we got without difficulty as much fresh water as we dared to take in the boats so that each was supplied with about sixty-five gallons we got also from one of the lockers a musket a small canister of powder a couple of files two rasps about two pounds of boat nails and a few turtle in the afternoon the wind came on to blow a strong breeze and having obtained everything that occurred to us could then be got out we began to make arrangements for our safety during the night a boat's line was made fast to the ship and to the other end of it one of the boats was moored at about fifty fathoms to leeward another boat was then attached to the first one about eight fathoms astern and the third boat the like distance astern of her night came on just as we had finished our operations and such a night as it was to us so full of feverish and distracting inquietude that we were deprived entirely of rest the wreck was constantly before my eyes i could not by any effort chase away the horrors of the preceding day from my mind they haunted me the live-long night my companions some of them were like sick women they had no idea of the extent of their deplorable situation one or two slept unconcernedly while others wasted the night in unavailing murmurs i now had full leisure to examine with some degree of coolness the dreadful circumstances of our disaster the scenes of yesterday passed in such quick succession in my mind that it was not until after many hours of severe reflection that i was able to discard the idea of the catastrophe as a dream alas it was one from which there was no awaking it was too certainly true that but yesterday we had existed as it were and in one short moment had been cut off from all the hopes and prospects of the living i have no language to paint out the horrors of our situation to shed tears was indeed altogether unavailing and withal unmanly yet i was not able to deny myself the relief they served to afford me after several hours of idle sorrow and repining i began to reflect upon the accident and endeavour to realise by what unaccountable destiny or design which i could not at first determine this sudden and most deadly attack had been made upon us by an animal too never before suspected of premeditated violence and proverbial for its insensibility and inoffensiveness 
every fact seemed to warrant me in concluding that it was anything but chance which directed his operations he made two several attacks upon the ship at a short interval between them both of which according to their direction were calculated to do us the most injury by being made ahead and thereby combining the speed of the two objects for the shock to effect which the exact manoeuvres which he made were necessary his aspect was most horrible and such as indicated resentment and fury he came directly from the shoal which we had just before entered and in which we had struck three of his companions as if fired with revenge for their sufferings but to this it may be observed that the mode of fighting which they always adopt is either with repeated strokes of their tails or snapping of their jaws together and that a case precisely similar to this one has never been heard of amongst the oldest and most experienced whalers to this i would answer that the structure and strength of the whale's head is admirably designed for this mode of attack the most prominent part of which is almost as hard and as tough as iron indeed i can compare it to nothing else but the inside of a horse's hoof upon which a lance or harpoon would not make the slightest impression the eyes and ears are removed nearly one-third the length of the whole fish from the front part of the head and are not in the least degree endangered in this mode of attack at all events the whole circumstances taken together all happening before my own eyes and producing at the time impressions in my mind of decided calculating mischief on the part of the whale many of which impressions i cannot now recall induce me to be satisfied that i am correct in my opinion it is certainly in all its bearings a hitherto unheard of circumstance and constitutes perhaps the most extraordinary one in the annals of the fishery end of section three four of the shipwreck of the whale ship essex by owen chase this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf chapter three part one november twenty first through the twenty second november twenty first the morning dawned upon our wretched company the weather was fine but the wind blew a strong breeze from the southeast and the sea was very rugged Watches had been kept up during the night in our respective boats to see that none of the spars or other articles which continued to float out of the wreck should be thrown by the surf against and injure the boats. At sunrise we began to think of doing something. What? We did not know. We cast loose our boats and visited the wreck to see if anything more of consequence could be preserved. But everything looked cheerless and desolate and we made a long and vain search for any useful article. Nothing could be found but a few turtle. Of these we had enough already, or at least as many as could be safely stowed in the boats, and we wandered around in every part of the ship in a sort of vacant idleness for the greater part of the morning. We were presently aroused to a perfect sense of our destitute and forlorn condition by thoughts of the means which we had for our subsistence the necessity of not wasting our time and of endeavouring to seek some relief wherever god might direct us our thoughts indeed hung about the ship wrecked and sunken as she was and we could scarcely discard from our minds the idea of her continuing protection some great efforts in our situation were necessary and a great deal of calculation important as it concerned the means by which our existence was to be supported during perhaps a very long period and a provision for our eventual deliverance accordingly by agreement all set to work in stripping off the light sails of the ship for sails to our boats and the day was consumed in making them up and fitting them we furnished ourselves with masts and other light spars that were necessary from the wreck each boat was rigged with two masts to carry a flying jib and two spritsails. The spritsails were made so two reefs could be taken in them in case of heavy blows. We continued to watch the wreck for any serviceable articles that might float from her, and kept one man during the day on the stump of her foremast on the lookout for vessels. Our work was very much impeded by the increase of the wind and sea, 
and the surf breaking almost continually into the boats gave us many fears that we should not be able to prevent our provisions from getting wet and above all served to increase the constant apprehensions that we had of the insufficiency of the boats themselves during the rough weather that we should necessarily experience in order to provide as much as possible against this and with all to strengthen the slight materials of which the boats were constructed we procured from the wreck some light cedar boards intended to repair boats in cases of accidents with which we built up additional sides about six inches above the gunwale these we afterwards found were of infinite service for the purpose for which they were intended in truth i am satisfied we could never have been preserved without them the boats must otherwise have taken in so much water that all the efforts of twenty such weak starving men as we afterwards came to be would not have sufficed to keep her free but what appeared most immediately to concern us and to command all our anxieties was the security of our provisions from the salt water we disposed of them under a covering of wood that whale boats have at either end of them wrapping it up in several thicknesses of canvas i got an observation to-day by which i found we were in latitude zero degrees six minutes south longitude one hundred and nineteen degrees thirty minutes west having been driven by the winds a distance of forty-nine miles the last twenty-four hours by this it would appear that there must have been a strong current setting us to the northwest during the whole time we were not able to finish our sails in one day and many little things preparatory to taking a final leave of the ship were necessary to be attended to but evening came and put an end to our labours we made the same arrangements for mooring the boats in safety and consigned ourselves to the horrors of another tempestuous night the wind continued to blow hard keeping up a heavy sea and veering around from southeast to east to east southeast as the gloom of night approached and obliged us to desist from that employment which cheated us out of some of the realities of our situation we all of us again became mute and desponding a considerable degree of alacrity had been manifested by many the preceding day as their attention had been wholly engaged in scrutinizing the wreck and in constructing the sails and spars for the boats but when they ceased to be occupied they passed to a sudden fit of melancholy and the miseries of their situation came upon them with such force as to produce spells of extreme debility approaching almost to fainting our provisions were scarcely touched the appetite was entirely gone but as we had a great abundance of water we indulged in frequent and copious draughts which our parched mouths seemed continually to need none asked for bread our continued state of anxiety during the night excluded all hopes of sleep still although the solemn fact had been before me for nearly two days my mind manifested the utmost repugnance to be reconciled to it i laid down in the bottom of the boat and resigned myself to reflection my silent prayers were offered up to the god of mercy for that protection which we stood so much in need of sometimes indeed a light hope would dawn but then to feel such an utter dependence on and consignment to chance alone for aid and rescue would chase it again from my mind the wreck the mysterious and mortal attack of the animal the sudden prostration and sinking of the vessel our escape from her and our then forlorn and almost hapless destiny all passed in quick and perplexing review in my imagination wearied with the exertion of the body and mind i caught near morning an hour's respite from my troubles in sleep november twenty second the wind remained the same and the weather continued remarkably fine at sunrise we again hauled our boats up and continued our search for articles that might float out about seven o'clock the deck of the wreck began to give way and every appearance indicated her speedy dissolution the oil had bilged in the hold and kept the surface of the sea all around us completely covered with it the bulkheads were all washed down and she worked in every part of her joints and seams with the violent and continual breaking of the surf over her seeing at last that little or nothing further could be done by remaining with the wreck and as it was all important that while our provisions lasted we should make the best possible use of time 
I rowed up to the captain's boat and asked him what he intended to do. I informed him that the ship's decks had burst up and that in all probability she would soon go to pieces, that no further purpose could be answered by remaining longer with her, since nothing more could be obtained from her, and that it was my opinion no time should be lost in making the best of our way towards the nearest land. The captain observed that he would go once more to the wreck and survey her, and after waiting until twelve o'clock for the purpose of getting an observation, would immediately after determine. In the meantime, before noon all our sails were completed, and the boats otherwise got in readiness for our departure. Our observation now proved us to be in latitude zero degrees thirteen minutes north, longitude one hundred and twenty degrees zero minutes west, as near as we could determine it having crossed the equator during the night and drifted nineteen miles the wind had veered considerably to the eastward during the last twenty-four hours our nautical calculations having been completed the captain after visiting the wreck called a council consisting of himself and the first and second mates who all repaired to his boat to interchange opinions and devise the best means for our security and preservation there were, in all of us, twenty men, six of whom were blacks, and we had three boats. We examined our navigators to ascertain the nearest land and found it was the Marquesas Islands. The Society Islands were next. These islands we were entirely ignorant of. If inhabited, we presumed they were by savages, from whom we had as much to fear as from the elements or even death itself. We had no charts from which our calculations might be aided, and were consequently obliged to govern ourselves by the navigators alone. It was also the captain's opinion that this was the season of the hurricanes, which prevail in the vicinity of the Sandwich Islands, and that consequently it would be unsafe to steer for them. The issue of our deliberations was that, taking all things into consideration, it would be most advisable to shape our course by the wind, to the southward, as far as 25 degrees or 26 degrees south latitude, fall in with the variable winds, and then endeavor to get eastward, to the coast of Chile or Peru. Accordingly, preparations were made for our immediate departure the boat which it was my fortune or rather misfortune to have was the worst of the three she was old and patched up having been stove a number of times during the cruise at best a whale boat is an extremely frail thing the most so of any other kind of boat they are what is called clinker built and constructed of the lightest materials for the purpose of being rowed with the greatest possible celerity according to the necessities of the business for which they are intended of all species of vessels they are the weakest and most fragile and possess but one advantage over any other that of lightness and buoyancy that enables them to keep above the dash of the sea with more facility than heavier ones this qualification is however preferable to that of any other and situated as we then were i would not have exchanged her old and crazy as she was for even a ship's launch i am quite confident that to this quality of our boats we most especially owed our preservation through the many days and nights of heavy weather that we afterwards encountered in consideration of my having the weakest boat six men were allocated to it while those of the captain and second mate took seven each and half past twelve we left the wreck steering our course with nearly all sail set south southeast at four o'clock in the afternoon we lost sight of her entirely many were the lingering and sorrowful looks we cast behind us it has appeared to me often since to have been in the abstract an extreme weakness and folly on our parts to have looked upon our shattered and sunken vessel with such an excessive fondness and regret but it seemed as if in abandoning her we had parted with all hope and were bending our course away from her rather by some dictate of despair we agreed to keep together in our boats as nearly as possible to afford assistance in case of accident and to render our reflections less melancholy by each other's presence i found it on this occasion true that misery does indeed love company unaided and unencouraged by each other 
there were with us many whose weak minds i am confident would have sunk under the dismal retrospections of the past catastrophe and who did not possess either sense or firmness enough to contemplate our approaching destiny without the cheering of some more determined countenance than their own the wind was strong all day and the sea ran very high our boat taking in water from her leaks continually so that we were obliged to keep one man constantly bailing during the night the weather became extremely rugged and the sea every now and then broke over us by agreement we were divided into two watches one of which was to be constantly awake and doing the labors of the boat such as bailing setting taking in and trimming the sails we kept our course very well together during this night and had many opportunities of conversation with the men in other boats wherein the means and prospects of our deliverance were variously considered it appeared from the opinions of all that we had most to hope for in the meeting with some vessel and most probably some whale-ship the great majority of whom in those seas we imagined were cruising about the latitude we were then steering for but this was only a hope the realization of which did not in any degree depend on our own exertions but on chance alone it was not therefore considered prudent by going out of our course with the prospect of meeting them to lose sight for one moment of the strong probabilities which under divine providence there were of our reaching land by the route we had prescribed to ourselves as that depended most especially on a reasonable calculation and on our own labors we conceived that our provision and water on a small allowance would last us sixty days that with the trade wind on the course we were then lying we should be able to average the distance of a degree a day which in twenty-six days would enable us to attain the region of the variable winds and then in thirty more at the very utmost should there be any favor in the elements we might reach the coast with these considerations we commenced our voyage the total failure of all which the subsequent dismal distress and suffering by which we were overtaken will be shown in the sequel our allowance of provision at first consisted of bread one biscuit weighing about one pound three ounces and half a pint of water a day for each man this small quantity less than one-third which is required by an ordinary person small as it was we however took without murmuring and on many an occasion afterwards blessed god that even this pittance was allowed to us in our misery the darkness of another night overtook us and having for the first time partook of our allowance of bread and water we laid our weary bodies down in the boat and endeavored to get some repose nature became at last worn out with the watchings and anxieties of the two preceding nights and sleep came insensibly upon us no dreams could break the strong fastenings of forgetfulness in which the mind was then locked up but for my own part my thoughts so haunted me that this luxury was yet a stranger to my eyes every recollection was still fresh before me and i enjoyed but a few short and unsatisfactory slumbers caught in the intervals between my hopes and my fears the dark ocean and swelling waters were nothing the fears of being swallowed up by some dreadful tempest or dashed upon hidden rocks with all the other ordinary subjects of fearful contemplation seemed scarcely entitled to a moment's thought the dismal looking wreck and the horrid aspect and revenge of the whale wholly engrossed my reflections until the day again made its appearance end of section four Section five of the shipwreck of the whale ship Essex by Owen Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Chapter three, part two, November twenty third to the thirtieth. November twenty third. In my chest, which I was fortunate enough to preserve, I had several small articles which we found of great service to us. Among the rest, some eight or ten sheets of writing paper a lead pencil, a suit of clothes, three small fish hooks, a jackknife, a whetstone, and a cake of soap. I commenced to keep a sort of journal with the little paper and pencil which I had, and the knife, besides other useful purposes, served us as a razor. 
it was with much difficulty however that i could keep any sort of record owing to the incessant rocking and unsteadiness of the boat and the continual dashing of the spray of the sea over us the boat contained in addition to the articles enumerated a lantern tinder-box and two or three candles which belonged to her and with which they are always kept supplied while engaged in taking whale in addition to all which the captain had saved a musket two pistols and a canister containing about two pounds of gunpowder the latter he distributed in equal proportions between the three boats and gave the second mate and myself each a pistol when morning came we found ourselves quite near together and the wind had considerably increased since the day before we were consequently obliged to reef our sails and although we did not apprehend any very great danger from the then violence of the wind yet it grew to be very uncomfortable in the boats from the repeated dashing of the waves that kept our bodies constantly wet with the salt spray we however stood along our course until twelve o'clock when we got an observation as well as we were able to obtain one while the water flew all over us and the sea kept the boat extremely unsteady we found ourselves this day in latitude zero degrees fifty eight minutes south having repassed the equator we abandoned the idea altogether of keeping any correct longitudinal reckoning having no glass nor log line the wind moderated in the course of the afternoon a little but at night came on to blow again almost a gale we began now to tremble for our little bark she was so ill calculated in point of strength to withstand the racking of the sea while it required the constant labors of one man to keep her free of water we were surrounded in the afternoon with porpoises that kept playing about us in great numbers and continued to follow us during the night november twenty fourth the wind had not abated any since the preceding day and the sea had risen to be very large and increased if possible the extreme uncomfortableness of our situation what added more than anything else to our misfortune was that all our efforts for the preservation of our provisions proved in great measure ineffectual a heavy sea broke suddenly into the boat and before we could snatch it up damaged some part of it by timely attention however and great caution we managed to make it eatable and to preserve the rest from a similar casualty this was a subject of extreme anxiety to us the expectation poor enough of itself indeed upon which our final rescue was founded must change at once to utter hopelessness deprived of our provisions the only means of continuing us in the exercise not only of our manual powers but in those of reason itself hence above all other things this was the object of our utmost solicitude and pains we ascertained the next day that some of the provisions in the captain's boat had shared a similar fate during the night both which accidents served to arouse us to a still stronger sense of our slender reliance upon the human means at our command and to show us our utter dependence on that divine aid which we so much the more stood in need of november twenty fifth no change of wind had yet taken place and we experienced the last night the same wet and disagreeable weather of the preceding one about eight o'clock in the morning we discovered that the water began to come fast in our boat and in a few minutes the quantity increased to such a degree as to alarm us considerably for our safety we commenced immediately a strict search in every part of her to discover the leak and after tearing up the ceiling or the floor of the boat near the bows we found it proceeded from one of the streaks or outside boards having burst off there no time was to be lost in devising some means to repair it the great difficulty consisted in its being in the bottom of the boat about six inches from the surface of the water it was necessary therefore to have access to the outside to enable us to fasten it on again the leak being to leeward we hove about and lay to on the other tack which brought it then nearly out of the water the captain who was at the time ahead of us seeing us manoeuvring to get the boat about shortened sail and presently tacked and ran down to us i informed him of our situation and he came immediately alongside to our assistance after directing all the men in the boat to get on one side the other by that means heeled out of the water a considerable distance 
and with little difficulty we then managed to drive in a few nails and secure it much beyond our expectations fears of no ordinary kind were excited by this seemingly small accident when it is recollected to what a slight vessel we had committed ourselves our means of safety alone consisting in her capacity and endurance for many weeks in all probability yet to come it will not be considered strange that this little accident should not only have dampened our spirits considerably but have thrown a great gloominess over the natural prospects of our deliverance on this occasion too we were enabled to rescue ourselves from inevitable destruction by the possession of a few nails without which had it not been our fortune to save some from the wreck we would in all human calculation have been lost we were still liable to a recurrence of the same accident perhaps to a worse still one as in the heavy and repeated racking of the swell the progress of our voyage would serve but to increase the incapacity and weakness of our boat and the starting of a single nail in her bottom would most assuredly prove our certain destruction we wanted not this additional reflection to add to the miseries of our situation november twenty sixth our sufferings heaven knows were now sufficiently increased and we looked forward not without an extreme dread and anxiety to the gloomy and disheartening prospect before us we experienced a little abatement of the wind and rough weather to-day and took the opportunity of drying the bread that had been wet the day previously to our great joy and satisfaction also the wind hauled out to the east northeast and enabled us to hold a much more favorable course with these exceptions no circumstance of any considerable interest occurred in the course of this day the twenty seventh of november was alike undistinguished for any incident worthy of note except that the wind again veered back to the east and destroyed the fine prospect we had entertained of making a good run for several days to come november twenty eighth the wind hauled still further to the southward and obliged us to fall off our course to south and commenced to blow with such violence as to put us again under short sail the night set in extremely dark and tempestuous and we began to entertain fears that we should be separated we however with great pains managed to keep about a ship's length apart so that the white sails of our boats could be distinctly discernible the captain's boat was but a short distance astern of mine and that of the second mate a few rods to leeward of his about eleven o'clock at night having laid down to sleep in the bottom of the boat i was suddenly awakened by one of my companions who cried out that the captain was in distress and was calling on us for assistance i immediately aroused myself and listened a moment to hear if anything further should be said when the captain's loud voice arrested my attention he was calling to the second mate whose boat was nearer to him than mine i made all haste to put about ran down to him and inquired what was the matter he replied i have been attacked by an unknown fish and he has stove my boat it appeared that some large fish had accompanied the boat for a short distance and had suddenly made an unprovoked attack upon her as nearly as they could determine with his jaws the extreme darkness of the night prevented them from distinguishing what kind of animal it was but they judged it to be about twelve feet in length and one of the killer fish species after having struck the boat once he continued to play about her on every side as if manifesting a disposition to renew the attack and did a second time strike the bows of the boat and split her stem they had no other instrument of offence but the sprit pole a long slender piece of wood by which the peak of the sail is extended with which after repeated attempts to destroy the boat they succeeded in beating him off i arrived just as he discontinued his operations and disappeared he had made a considerable breach in the bows of the boat through which the water began to pour fast and the captain imagining matters to be considerably worse than they were immediately took measures to remove his provisions into the second mate's boat and mine in order to lighten his own and by that means and constant bailing to keep her above the water until daylight should enable him to discover the extent of the damage and to repair it the night was spicy darkness itself the sky was completely overcast and it seemed to us as if fate was wholly relentless in pursuing us with such a cruel complication of disasters 
we were not without our fears that the fish might renew his attack some time during the night upon one of the other boats and unexpectedly destroy us but they proved entirely groundless as he was never afterwards seen when daylight came the wind again favoured us a little and we all lay to to repair the broken boat which was effected by nailing on thin strips of boards in the inside and having replaced the provisions we proceeded again on our course our allowance of water which in the commencement merely served to administer to the positive demands of nature became now to be insufficient and we began to experience violent thirst from the consumption of the provisions that had been wet with salt water and dried in the sun of these we were obliged to eat first to prevent their spoiling and we could not nay we did not dare to make any encroachments on our stock of water our determination was to suffer as long as human patience and endurance would hold out having only in view the relief that would be afforded us when the quantity of wet provisions should be exhausted our extreme sufferings here first commenced the privation of water is justly ranked among the most dreadful of the miseries of our life the violence of raving thirst has no parallel in the catalogue of human calamities it was our hard lot to have felt this in its extremest force when necessity subsequently compelled us to seek resource from one of the offices of nature we were not at first aware of the consequences of eating this bread and it was not until the fatal effects of it had shown themselves to a degree of oppression that we could divine the cause of our extreme thirst but alas there was no relief ignorant or instructed of the fact it was alike immaterial it composed a part of our subsistence and reason imposed upon us the necessity of its immediate consumption as otherwise it would have been lost to us entirely november twenty ninth our boats appeared to be growing daily more frail and insufficient the continual flowing of the water into them seem increased without our being able to assign it to anything else than a general weakness arising from causes that must in a short time without some remedy or relief produce their total failure we did not neglect however to patch up and mend them according to our means whenever we could discover a broken or weak part we this day found ourselves surrounded by a shoal of dolphins some or one of which we tried in vain a long time to take we made a small line from some rigging that was in the boat fastened on one of the fish hooks and tied to it a small piece of white rag they took not the least notice of it but continued playing about us nearly all day mocking both our misery and our efforts november thirtieth this was a remarkably fine day the weather not exceeded by any that we had experienced since we left the wreck at one o'clock i proposed to our boat's crew to kill one of the turtle two of which we had in our possession i need not say that the proposition was hailed with the utmost enthusiasm hunger had set its ravenous gnawings upon our stomachs and we waited with impatience to suck the warm flowing blood of the animal a small fire was kindled in the shell of the turtle and after dividing the blood of which there was about a gill among those who felt disposed to drink it we cooked the remainder entrails and all and enjoyed from it an unspeakably fine repast the stomachs of two or three revolted at the sight of the blood and refused to partake of it not even the outrageous thirst that was upon them could induce them to taste it for myself i took it like a medicine to relieve the extreme dryness of my palate and stopped not to inquire whether it was anything else than a liquid after this i may say exquisite banquet our bodies were considerably recruited and i felt my spirits now much higher than they had been at any time before by observation this day we found ourselves in latitude seven degrees fifty three minutes south our distance from the wreck as nearly as we could calculate was then about four hundred and eighty miles end of section five Six of the shipwreck of the whale ship Essex by Owen Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Chapter three, part three, December first to the fourteenth. December first. 
from the first to the third of december exclusive there was nothing transpired of any moment our boats as yet kept admirably well together and the weather was distinguished for its mildness and salubrity we gathered consolation too from a favourable slant which the wind took to the northeast and our situation was not at that moment we thought so comfortless as we had been led at first to consider it but in our extravagant felicitations upon the blessing of the wind and weather we forgot our leaks and our weak boats and our own debility our immense distance from land the smallness of our stock of provisions all which when brought to mind with the force which they deserved were too well calculated to dishearten us and cause us to sigh for the hardships of our lot up to the third of december the raging thirst of our mouths had not been but in a small degree alleviated had it not been for the pains which that gave us we should have tasted during this spell of fine weather a species of enjoyment derived from a momentary forgetfulness of our actual situation december third with great joy we hailed the last crumb of our damaged bread and commenced this day to take our allowance of healthy provisions the salutary and agreeable effects of this change were felt at first in so slight a degree as to give us no great cause of comfort or satisfaction but gradually as we partook our small allowance of water the moisture began to collect in our mouths and the parching fever of the palate imperceptibly left it an accident here happened to us which gave us a great momentary spell of uneasiness the night was dark and the sky was completely overcast so that we could scarcely discern each other's boats when at about ten o'clock that of the second mate was suddenly missing i felt for a moment considerable alarm at her unexpected disappearance but after a little reflection i immediately hove to struck a light as expeditiously as possible and hoisted it at the masthead in a lantern our eyes were now directed over every part of the ocean in search of her when to our great joy we discerned an answering light about a quarter mile to leeward of us we ran down to it and it proved to be the lost boat strange as the extraordinary interest which we felt in each other's company may appear and much as our repugnance to separation may seem to imply of weakness it was the subject of our continual hopes and fears it is truly remarked that misfortune more than anything else serves to endear us to our companions so strongly was this sentiment engrafted upon our feelings and so closely were the destinies of all of us involuntarily linked together that had one of the boats been wrecked and wholly lost with all her provisions and water we should have felt ourselves constrained by every tie of humanity to have taken the surviving sufferers into the other boats and shared our bread and water with them while a crumb of one or a drop of the other remained hard indeed would the case have been for all and much as i have since reflected on the subject i have not been able to realize had it so happened that a sense of our necessities would have allowed us to give so magnanimous and devoted a character to our feelings i can only speak of the impressions which i recollect i had at the time subsequently however as our situation became more straitened and desperate our conversation on this subject took a different turn and it appeared to be an universal sentiment that such a course of conduct was calculated to weaken the chances of a final deliverance of some and might be the only means of consigning every soul of us to a horrid death of starvation there is no question but that an immediate separation therefore was the most politic measure that could be adopted and that every boat should take its own separate chance while we remained together should any accident happen of the nature alluded to no other course could be adopted than that of taking the survivors into the other boats and giving up voluntarily what we were satisfied could alone prolong our hopes and multiply the chances of our safety or unconcernedly witness their struggles in death perhaps beat them from our boats with weapons back into the ocean the expectation of reaching the land was founded upon a reasonable calculation of the distance the means and the subsistence all which were scanty enough god knows and ill adapted to the probable exigencies of the voyage 
any addition to our own demands in this respect would not only injure but actually destroy the whole system which we had laid down and reduce us to slight hope derived either from the speedy death of some of our crew or the falling in with some vessel with all this however there was a desperate instinct that bound us together we could not reason on the subject with any degree of satisfaction to our minds yet we continued to cling to each other with a strong and involuntary impulse this indeed was a matter of no small difficulty and it constituted more than anything else a source of continual watching and inquietude we would but turn our eyes away for a few moments during some dark nights and presently one of the boats would be missing there was no other remedy than to heave to immediately and set a light by which the missing boat might be directed to us these proceedings necessarily interfered very much with our speed and consequently lessened our hopes but we preferred to submit to it while the consequences were not so immediately felt rather than part with the consolation which each other's presence afforded nothing of importance took place on the fourth of december and on the fifth at night owing to the extreme darkness and a strong wind i again separated from the other boats finding they were not to be seen in any direction i loaded my pistol and fired it twice soon after the second discharge they made their appearance a short distance to windward and we joined company and again kept on our course in which we continued without any remarkable occurrence through the sixth and the seventh of december the wind during this period blew very strong and much more unfavorably our boats continued to leak and to take in a good deal of water over the gunwales december eighth in the afternoon of this day the wind set in east southeast and began to blow much harder than we had yet experienced it by twelve o'clock at night it had increased to a perfect gale with heavy showers of rain and we now began from these dreadful indications to prepare ourselves for destruction we continued to take in sail by degrees as the tempest gradually increased until at last we were obliged to take down our masts at this juncture we gave up entirely to the mercy of the waves the sea and rain had wet us to the skin and we sat down silently and with sullen resignation awaiting our fate we made an effort to catch some fresh water by spreading one of the sails but after having spent a long time and obtained but a small quantity in a bucket it proved to be quite as salt as that from the ocean this we attributed to its having passed through the sail which had been so often wet by the sea and upon which after drying so frequently in the sun concretions of salt had been formed it was a dreadful night cut off from any imaginary relief nothing remained but to await the approaching issue with firmness and resignation the appearance of the heavens was dark and dreary and the blackness that was spread over the face of the waters dismal beyond description the heavy squalls that followed each other in quick succession were preceded by sharp flashes of lightning that appeared to wrap our little barge in flames the sea rose to a fearful height and every wave that came looked as if it must be the last that would be necessary for our destruction to an overruling providence alone must be attributed our salvation from the horrors of that terrible night it can be accounted for in no other way that a speck of substance like that which we were before the driving tears of the tempest could have been conducted safely through it at twelve o'clock it began to abate a little in intervals of two or three minutes during which we would venture to raise up our heads and look to windward our boat was completely unmanageable without sails mast or rudder and had been driven in the course of the afternoon and night we knew not whither nor how far when the gale had in some measure subsided we made efforts to get a little sail upon her and put her head towards the course we had been steering my companions had not slept any during the whole night and were dispirited and broken down to such a degree as to appear to want some more powerful stimulus than the fears of death to enable them to do their duty by great exertions however towards morning we again set a double reefed mainsail and jib upon her and began to make tolerable progress on the voyage an unaccountable good fortune had kept the boats together during all the troubles of the night 
and the sun rose and showed the disconsolate faces of our companions once more to each other december ninth by twelve o'clock this day we were enabled to set all sail as usual but there continued to be a very heavy sea running which opened the seams of the boats and increased the leaks to an alarming degree there was however no remedy for this but continual bailing which had now become to be an extremely irksome and laborious task by observation we found ourselves in latitude seventeen degrees forty minutes south at eleven o'clock at night the captain's boat was unexpectedly found to be missing after the last accident of this kind we had agreed if the same should again occur that in order to save our time the other boats should not heave to as usual but continue on their course until morning and thereby save the great detention that must arise from such repeated delays we however concluded on this occasion to make a small effort which if it did not immediately prove the means of restoring the lost boat we would discontinue and again make sail accordingly we hove to for an hour during which time i fired my pistol twice and obtaining no tidings of the boat we stood on our course when daylight appeared she was to leeward of us about two miles upon observing her we immediately ran down and again joined company december tenth i have omitted to notice the gradual advances which hunger and thirst for the last six days had made upon us as the time had lengthened since our departure from the wreck and the allowance of provisions making the demands of the appetite daily more and more importunate they had created in us an almost uncontrollable temptation to violate our resolution and satisfy for once the hard yearnings of nature from our stock but a little reflection served to convince us of the imprudence and unmanliness of the measure and it was abandoned with a sort of melancholy effort of satisfaction i had taken into custody by common consent all the provisions and water belonging to the boat and was determined that no encroachments should be made upon it with my consent nay i felt myself bound by every consideration of duty by every dictate of sense of prudence and discretion without which in my situation all other exertions would have been folly itself to protect them at the hazard of my life for this purpose i locked up in my chest the whole quantity and never for a single moment closed my eyes without placing some part of my person in contact with the chest and having loaded my pistol kept it constantly about me i should not certainly have put any threats in execution as long as the most distant hopes of reconciliation existed and was determined in case the least refractory disposition should be manifested a thing which i contemplated not unlikely to happen with a set of starving wretches like ourselves that i would immediately divide our subsistence into equal proportions and give each man's share into his own keeping then should any attempt be made upon mine which i intended to mete out to myself according to exigencies i was resolved to make the consequences of it fatal there was however the most upright and obedient behaviour in this respect manifested by every man in the boat and i never had the least opportunity of proving what my conduct would have been on such an occasion while standing on our course this day we came across a small shoal of flying fish four of which in their efforts to avoid us flew against the mainsail and dropped into the boat one having fell near me i eagerly snatched up and devoured the other three were immediately taken by the rest and eaten alive for the first time i on this occasion felt a disposition to laugh upon witnessing the ludicrous and almost desperate efforts of my five companions who each sought to get a fish they were very small of the kind and constituted but an extremely delicate mouthful scales wings and all for hungry stomachs like ours from the eleventh to the thirteenth of december inclusive our progress was very slow owing to the light winds and calms and nothing transpired of any moment except that on the eleventh we killed the only remaining turtle and enjoyed another luxuriant repast that invigorated our bodies and gave a fresh flow to our spirits 
the weather was extremely hot and we were exposed to the full force of the meridian sun without any covering to shield us from its burning influence or the least breath of air to cool its parching rays on the thirteenth day of december we were blessed with a change of wind to the northward that brought us a most welcome and unlooked-for relief we now for the first time actually felt what might be deemed a reasonable hope of our deliverance and with hearts bounding with satisfaction and bosoms swelling with joy we made all sail to the eastward we imagined we had run out of the trade winds and had got into the variables and should in all probability reach the land many days sooner than we expected but alas our anticipations were but a dream from which we shortly experienced a cruel awaking the wind gradually died away and at night was succeeded by a perfect calm more oppressive and disheartening to us from the bright prospects which had attended us during the day the gloomy reflections that this hard fortune had given birth to were succeeded by others of a no less cruel and discouraging nature when we found the calm continued during the fourteenth fifteenth and sixteenth of december inclusive the extreme oppression of the weather the sudden and unexpected prostration of our hopes and the consequent dejection of our spirits set us again to thinking and filled our souls with fearful and melancholy forebodings in this state of affairs seeing no alternative left us but to employ to the best advantage all human expedients in our power i proposed on the fourteenth to reduce our allowance of provisions one half no objections were made to this arrangement all submitted or seemed to do so with an admirable fortitude and forbearance the proportion which our stock of water bore to our bread was not large and while the weather continued so oppressive we did not think it advisable to diminish our scanty pittance indeed it would have been scarcely possible to have done so with any regard to our necessities as our thirst had become now incessantly more intolerable than hunger and the quantity then allowed was barely sufficient to keep the mouth in a state of moisture for about one-third of the time patience and long-suffering was the constant language of our lips and a determination strong as the resolves of the soul could make it to cling to existence as long as hope and breath remained to us in vain was every expedient tried to relieve the raging fever of the throat by drinking salt water and holding small quantities of it in the mouth until by that means the thirst was increased to such a degree as even to drive us to despairing and vain relief from our own urine our sufferings during these calm days almost exceeded human belief the hot rays of the sun beat down upon us to such a degree as to oblige us to hang over the gunwale of the boat into the sea to cool our weak and fainting bodies this expedient afforded us however a grateful relief and was productive of a discovery of infinite importance to us no sooner had one of us got on the outside of the gunwale than he immediately observed the bottom of the boat to be covered with a species of small clam which upon being tasted proved to be a most delicious and agreeable food this was no sooner announced to us than we commenced to tear them off and eat them for a few minutes like a set of gluttons and after having satisfied the immediate craving of the stomach we gathered large quantities and laid them up in the boat but hunger came upon us again in less than half an hour afterwards within which time they had all disappeared upon attempting to get in again we found ourselves so weak as to require each other's assistance indeed had it not been for three of our crew who could not swim and who did not therefore get overboard i know not by what means we should have been able to resume our situations in the boat end of section six seven of the shipwreck of the whale ship essex by owen chase this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf chapter three part four december fifteenth to the twenty second on the fifteenth our boat continued to take in water so fast from her leaks and the weather proved so moderate we concluded to search out the bad places and endeavor to mend them as well as we should be able after a considerable search and removing the ceiling near the bows 
we found the principal opening was occasioned by the starting of a plank or streak in the bottom of the boat next to the keel to remedy this it was now absolutely necessary to have access to the bottom the means of doing which did not immediately occur to our minds after a moment's reflection however one of the crew benjamin lawrence offered to tie a rope around his body take a boat's hatchet in his hand and thus go under the water and hold the hatchet against a nail to be driven through from the inside for the purpose of clenching it this was accordingly all effected with some little trouble and answered the purpose much beyond our expectations our latitude was this day twenty one degrees forty two minutes south the oppression of the weather still continuing through the sixteenth bore upon our health and spirits with an amazing force and severity the most disagreeable excitements were produced by it which added to the disconsolate endurance of the calm called loudly for some mitigating expedient some sort of relief to our prolonged sufferings by our observations to-day we found in addition to our other calamities that we had been urged back from our progress by the heave of the sea a distance of ten miles and were still without any prospect of wind in this distressing posture of our affairs the captain proposed that we should commence rowing which being seconded by all we immediately concluded to take a double allowance of provision and water for the day and row during the cool of the nights until we should get a breeze from some quarter or other accordingly when night came we commenced our laborious operations we made but a very sorry progress hunger and thirst and long inactivity had so weakened us that in three hours every man gave out and we abandoned the further prosecution of the plan with the sunrise the next morning on the seventeenth a light breeze sprung up from the southeast and although directly ahead it was welcomed with almost frenzied feelings of gratitude and joy december eighteenth the wind had increased this day considerably and by twelve o'clock blew a gale veering from southeast to east southeast again we were compelled to take in all sail and to lie to for the principal part of the day at night however it died away and the next day the nineteenth proved very moderate and pleasant weather and we again commenced to make a little progress december twentieth this was a day of great happiness and joy after having experienced one of the most distressing nights in the whole catalogue of our sufferings we awoke to a morning of comparative luxury and pleasure about seven o'clock while we were sitting dispirited silent and dejected in our boats one of our companions suddenly and loudly called out there is land we were all aroused in an instant as if electrified and casting our eyes to leeward there indeed was the blessed vision before us as plain and palpable as could be wished for a new and extraordinary impulse now took possession of us we shook off the lethargy of our senses and seemed to take another and a fresh existence one or two of my companions whose lagging spirits and worn-out frames had begun to inspire them with an utter indifference to their fate now immediately brightened up and manifested a surprising alacrity and earnestness to gain without delay the much wished for shore it appeared at first a low white beach and lay like a basking paradise before our longing eyes it was discovered nearly at the same time by the other boats and a general burst of joy and congratulation now passed between us it is not within the scope of human calculation by a mere listener to the story to divine what the feelings of our hearts were on this occasion alternate expectation fear gratitude surprise and exultation each swayed our minds and quickened our exertions we ran down for it and at eleven o'clock a m we were within a quarter mile of the shore it was an island to all appearance as nearly as we could determine it about six miles long and three broad with a very high rugged shore and surrounded by rocks the sides of the mountains were bare but on the tops it looked fresh and green with vegetation 
upon examining our navigators we found it was ducie's island lying in latitude twenty four degrees forty minutes south longitude one hundred and twenty four degrees forty minutes west a short moment sufficed for reflection and we made immediate arrangements to land none of us knew whether the island was inhabited or not nor what it afforded if anything if inhabited it was uncertain whether by beasts or savages and a momentary suspense was created by the dangers which might possibly arise by proceeding without due preparation and care hunger and thirst however soon determined us and having taken the musket and pistols i with three others effected a landing upon some sunken rocks and waded thence to the shore upon arriving at the beach it was necessary to take a little breath and we laid down for a few minutes to rest our weak bodies before we could proceed let the reader judge if he can what must have been our feelings now bereft of all comfortable hopes of life for the space of thirty days of terrible suffering our bodies wasted to mere skeletons by hunger and thirst and death itself staring us in the face to be suddenly and unexpectedly conducted to a rich banquet of food and drink which subsequently we enjoyed for a few days to our full satisfaction and he will have but a faint idea of the happiness that here fell to our lot we now after a few minutes separated and went different directions in search of water the want of which had been our principal privation and called for immediate relief i had not proceeded far in my excursion before i discovered a fish about a foot and a half in length swimming along in the water close to the shore i commenced an attack upon him with the breech of my gun and struck him i believe at once and he ran under a small rock that lay near the shore from whence i took him with the aid of my ramrod and brought him up on the beach and immediately fell to eating my companions soon joined in the repast and in less than ten minutes the whole was consumed bones and skin and scales and all with full stomachs we imagined we could now attempt the mountains where if in any part of the island we considered water would be most probably obtained i accordingly clambered with excessive labour suffering and pain up amongst the bushes roots and underwood of one of the crags looking in all directions in vain for every appearance of water that might present itself there was no indication of the least moisture to be found within a distance to which i had ascended although my strength did not enable me to get higher than about twenty feet i was sitting down at the height that i had attained to gather a little breath and ruminating upon the fruitlessness of my search and the consequent evils and continuation of suffering that it necessarily implied when i perceived that the tide had risen considerably since our landing and threatened to cut off our retreat to the rocks by which alone we should be able to regain our boats i therefore determined to proceed again to the shore and inform the captain and the rest of our want of success in procuring water and consult upon the propriety of remaining at the island any longer i never for one moment lost sight of the main chance which i conceived we still had of either getting to the coast or of meeting with some vessel at sea and felt that every minute's detention without some equivalent object was lessening those chances by a consumption of the means of our support when i had got down one of my companions informed me that he had found a place in a rock some distance off from which the water exuded in small drops at intervals of about five minutes that he had by applying his lips to the rock obtained a few of them which only served to whet his appetite and from which nothing like the least satisfaction had proceeded i immediately resolved in my own mind upon this information to advise remaining until morning to endeavour to make a more thorough search the next day and with our hatchets to pick away the rock which had been discovered with the view of increasing if possible the run of water we all repaired again to our boats and there found that the captain had the same impressions as to the propriety of our delay until morning we therefore landed and having hauled our boats up on the beach laid down in them that night free from all the anxieties of watching and labour 
and amid all our sufferings gave ourselves up to an unreserved forgetfulness and peace of mind that seemed so well to accord with the pleasing anticipations that this day had brought forth it was but a short space however until the morning broke upon us and sense and feeling and gnawing hunger and the raging fever of thirst then redoubled my wishes and efforts to explore the island again we had obtained that night a few crabs by traversing the shore a considerable distance and a few very small fish but waited until the next day for the labours of which we considered a night of refreshing and undisturbed repose would better qualify us december twenty first we had still reserved our common allowance but it was entirely inadequate for the purpose of supplying the raging demands of the palate and such an excessive and cruel thirst was created as almost to deprive us of the power of speech the lips became cracked and swollen and a sort of glutinous saliva collected in the mouth disagreeable to the taste and intolerable beyond expression our bodies had wasted away to almost skin and bone and possessed so little strength as often to require each other's assistance in performing some of its weakest functions relief we now felt must come soon or nature would sink the most perfect discipline was still maintained in respect to our provisions and it now became our whole object if we should not be able to replenish our subsistence from the island to obtain by some means or other a sufficient refreshment to enable us to prosecute our voyage our search for water accordingly again commenced with the morning each of us took a different direction and prosecuted the examination of every place where there was the least indication of it the small leaves of the shrubbery affording a temporary alleviation by being chewed in the mouth and but for the peculiarly bitter taste which those of the island possessed would have been an extremely grateful substitute in the course of our rambles too along the sides of the mountain we would now and then meet with tropic birds of a beautiful figure and plumage occupying small holes in the sides of it from which we plucked them without the least difficulty upon our approaching them they made no attempts to fly nor did they appear to notice us at all these birds served us for a fine repast numbers of which were caught in the course of the day cooked by fires which we made on the shore and eaten with the utmost avidity we found also a plant in taste not unlike the pepper grass growing in considerable abundance in the crevices of the rocks and which provided to us a very agreeable food by being chewed with the meat of the birds these with birds nests some of them full of young and others of eggs a few of which we found in the course of the day served us for food and supplied the place of our bread from the use of which during our stay here we had restricted ourselves but water the great object of all our anxieties and exertions was nowhere to be found and we began to despair of meeting with it on the island our state of extreme weakness and many of us without shoes or any covering for the feet prevented us from exploring any great distance lest by some sudden faintness or over-exertion we should not be able to return and at night be exposed to the attacks of wild beasts which might inhabit the island and be alike incapable of resistance as beyond the reach of the feeble assistance that otherwise could be afforded to each the whole day was thus consumed in picking up whatever had the least shape or quality of sustenance and another night of misery was before us to be passed without a drop of water to cool our parching tongues in this state of affairs we could not reconcile it to ourselves to remain longer at this place a day an hour lost to us unnecessarily here might cost us our preservation a drop of the water that we then had in our possession might prove in the last stages of our debility the very cordial of life i addressed the substance of these few reflections to the captain who agreed with me in opinion upon the necessity of taking some decisive steps in our present dilemma after some considerable conversation on this subject 
it was finally concluded to spend the succeeding day in the further search for water and if none should be found to quit the island the morning after december twenty second we had been employed during the last night in various occupations according to the feelings or the wants of the men some continued to wander about the shore and to short distances in the mountains still seeking for food and water others hung about the beach near the edge of the sea endeavouring to take the little fish that came about them some slept insensible to every feeling but rest while others spent the night in talking of their situation and reasoning upon the probabilities of their deliverance the dawn of day aroused us again to labour and each of us pursued his own inclination as to the course taken over the island after water my principal hope was founded upon my success in picking the rocks where the moisture had been discovered the day before and thither i hastened as soon as my strength would enable me to get there it was about a quarter of a mile from what i may call our encampment and with two men who had accompanied me i commenced my labours with a hatchet and an old chisel the rock proved to be very soft and in a very short time i had obtained a considerable hole but alas without the least wished for effect i watched it for some little time with great anxiety hoping that as i increased the depth of the hole the water would presently flow but all my hopes and efforts were unavailing and at last i desisted from further labour and sat down near it in utter despair as i turned my eyes towards the beach i saw some of the men in the act of carrying a keg along from the boats with i thought an extraordinary spirit and activity and the idea suddenly darted across my mind that they had found water and were taking a keg to fill it i quitted my seat in a moment made the best of my way towards them with a palpitating heart and before i came up with them they gave me the cheering news that they had found a spring of water i felt at that moment as if i could have fallen down and thanked god for this signal act of his mercy the sensation that i experienced was indeed strange and such as i shall never forget at one instant i felt an almost choking excess of joy and at the next i wanted the relief of a flood of tears when i arrived at the spot whither i had hastened as fast as my weak legs would carry me i found my companions had all taken their fill and with an extreme degree of forbearance i then satisfied myself by drinking in small quantities and at intervals of two or three minutes apart many had notwithstanding the remonstrances of prudence and in some cases force laid down and thoughtlessly swallowed large quantities of it until they could drink no more the effect of this was however neither so sudden nor bad as we had imagined it only served to make them a little stupid and indolent for the remainder of the day upon examining the place from whence we had obtained this miraculous and unexpected succour we were equally astonished and delighted with the discovery it was on the shore above which the sea flowed to the depth of near six feet and we could procure water therefore from it only when the tide was down the crevice from which it rose was in a flat rock large surfaces of which were spread around and composed the face of the beach we filled our two kegs before the tide rose and went back again to our boats the remainder of this day was spent in seeking for fish crabs birds and anything else that fell in our way that could contribute to satisfy our appetites and we enjoyed during that night a most comfortable and delicious sleep unattended with those violent cravings of hunger and thirst that had poisoned our slumbers for so many previous ones since the discovery of the water too we had began to entertain different notions altogether of our situation there was no doubt we might here depend upon a constant and ample supply of it as long as we chose to remain and in all probability we could manage to obtain food until the island should be visited by some vessel or time allowed to devise other means of leaving it our boats would still remain to us a stay here might enable us to mend strengthen and put them in more perfect order for the sea and get ourselves so far recruited as to be able to endure if necessary 
a more protracted voyage to the mainland i made a silent determination in my own mind that i would myself pursue something like this plan whatever might be the opinion of the rest but i found no difference in the views of any of us as to this matter we therefore concluded to remain at least four or five days within which time it could be sufficiently known whether it would be advisable to make any arrangements for a more permanent abode end of section seven of the shipwreck of the whale ship essex by owen chase this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf chapter three part five december twenty third to january seventh december twenty third at eleven o'clock a m we again visited our spring the tide had fallen to about a foot below it and we were able to procure before it rose again about twenty gallons of water it was at first a little brackish but soon became fresh from the constant supply from the rock and the departure of the sea our observations this morning tended to give us every confidence in its quantity and quality and we therefore rested perfectly easy in our minds on the subject and commenced to make further discoveries about the island each man sought for his own daily living on whatsoever the mountains the shore or the sea could furnish him with and every day during our stay there the whole time was employed in roving about for food we found however on the twenty fourth that we had picked up on the island everything that could be got at in the way of sustenance and much to our surprise some of the men came in at night and complained of not having gotten sufficient during the day to satisfy the cravings of their stomachs every accessible part of the mountain contiguous to us or within reach of our weak enterprise was already ransacked for birds eggs and grass and was rifled of all that they contained so that we began to entertain serious apprehensions that we should not be able to live long here at any rate with the view of being prepared as well as possible should necessity at any time oblige us to quit it we commenced on the twenty fourth to repair our boats and continued to work upon them all that and the succeeding day we were enabled to do this with much facility by drawing them up and turning them over on the beach working by spells of two or three hours at a time and then leaving off to seek for food we procured our water daily when the tide would leave the shore but on the evening of the twenty fifth found that a fruitless search for nourishment had not repaid us for the labors of a whole day there was no one thing on the island upon which we could in the least degree rely except the pepper grass and of that the supply was precarious and not much relished without some other food our situation here therefore now became worse than it would have been in our boats on the ocean because in the latter case we should be still making some progress towards land while our other provisions lasted and the chance of falling in with some vessel be considerably increased it was certain that we ought not to remain here unless upon the strongest assurances in our own minds of sufficient sustenance and that too in regular supplies that might be depended upon after much conversation amongst us on this subject and again examining our navigators it was finally concluded to set sail for easter island which we found to be east southeast from us in latitude twenty seven degrees nine minutes south longitude one hundred nine degrees thirty five minutes west all we knew of this island was that it existed as laid down in the books but of its extent productions or inhabitants if any we were entirely ignorant at any rate it was near by eight hundred and fifty miles to the coast and could not be worse in its productions than the one we were about leaving the twenty sixth of december was wholly employed in preparations for our departure our boats were hauled down to the vicinity of the spring and our casks and everything else that would contain it filled with water there had been considerable talk between three of our companions about their remaining on this island and taking their chance both for a living and an escape from it 
and as the time drew near at which we were to leave they made up their minds to stay behind the rest of us could make no objection to their plan as it lessened the load of our boats allowed us their share of the provisions and the probability of their being able to sustain themselves on the island was much stronger than that of our reaching the mainland should we however ever arrive safely it would become our duty and we so assured them to give information of their situation and make every effort to procure their removal from thence which we accordingly afterwards did their names were william wright of barnstable massachusetts thomas chapel of plymouth england and seth weeks of the former place they had begun before we came away to construct a sort of habitation composed of branches of trees and we left with them every little article that could be spared from the boats it was their intention to build a considerable dwelling that would protect them from the rains as soon as time and materials could be provided the captain wrote letters to be left on the island giving information of the fate of the ship and that of our own and stating that we had set out to reach easter island with further particulars intended to give notice should our fellow sufferers die there and the place be ever visited by any vessel of our misfortunes these letters were put in a tin case and closed in a small wooden box and nailed to a tree on the west side of the island near our landing place we had observed some days previously the name of a ship the elizabeth cut out in the bark of this tree which rendered it indubitable that one of that name had once touched here there was however no date to it nor anything else by which any further particulars could be made out december twenty seventh i went before we set sail this morning and procured for each boat a flat stone and two armfuls of wood with which to make a fire in our boats should it become afterwards necessary in the further prosecution of our voyage as we calculated we might catch a fish or a bird and in that case be provided with the means of cooking it otherwise from the intense heat of the weather we knew they could not be preserved from spoiling at ten o'clock a m the tide having risen far enough to allow our boats to float over the rocks we made all sail and steered around the island for the purpose of making a little further observation which would not detain us any time and might be productive of some unexpected good fortune before we started we missed our three companions and found they had not come down either to assist us to get off nor to take any kind of leave of us i walked up the beach towards their rude dwelling and informed them that we were about to set sail and should probably never see them more they seemed to be very much affected and one of them shed tears they wished us to write to their relations should providence safely direct us again to our homes and said but little else they had every confidence in being able to procure a subsistence there as long as they remained and finding them ill at heart about taking any leave of us i hastily bid them good-bye hoped they would do well and came away they followed me with their eyes until i was out of sight and i never saw more of them on the northwest side of the island we perceived a fine white beach on which we imagined we might land and in a short time ascertain if any further useful discoveries could be effected or any addition made to our stock of provisions and having set ashore five or six of the men for this purpose the rest of us shoved off the boats and commenced fishing we saw a number of sharks but all efforts to take them proved ineffectual and we got but a few small fish about the size of a mackerel which we divided amongst us in this business we were occupied for the remainder of the day until six o'clock in the afternoon when the men having returned to the shore from their search in the mountains brought a few birds and we again set sail and steered directly for easter island during that night after we had got quite clear of the land we had a fine strong breeze from the northwest we kept our fires going and cooked our fish and birds and felt our situation as comfortable as could be expected we continued on our course consuming our provisions and water as sparingly as possible without any material incident until the thirtieth 
when the wind hauled out east southeast directly ahead and so continued until the thirty first when it again came to the northward and we resumed our course on the third of january we experienced heavy squalls from the west southwest accompanied with dreadful thunder and lightning that threw a gloomy and cheerless aspect over the ocean and incited a recurrence of some of those heavy and despondent moments that we had before experienced we commenced from ducie's island to keep a regular reckoning by which on the fourth of january we found we had got to the southward of easter island and the wind prevailing east northeast we should not be able to get on to the eastward so as to reach it our birds and fish were all now consumed and we had begun again upon our short allowance of bread it was necessary in this state of things to change our determination of going to easter island and shape our course in some other direction where the wind would allow of our going we had but little hesitation in concluding therefore to steer for the island of juan fernandez which lay about east southeast from us distant two thousand five hundred miles we bent our course accordingly towards it having for the two succeeding days very light winds and suffering excessively from the intense heat of the sun the seventh brought us a change of wind to the northward and at twelve o'clock we found ourselves in latitude thirty degrees eighteen minutes south longitude one hundred and seventeen degrees twenty nine minutes west we continued to make what progress we could to the eastward end of section eight of the shipwreck of the whale ship essex by owen chase this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf chapter three part six january tenth to the twenty fourth january tenth matthew p joy the second mate had suffered from debility and the privations we had experienced much beyond any of the rest of us and was on the eighth removed to the captain's boat under the impression that he would be more comfortable there and more attention and pains be bestowed in nursing and endeavoring to comfort him this day being calm he manifested a desire to be taken back again but at four o'clock in the afternoon after having been according to his wishes placed in his own boat he died very suddenly after his removal on the eleventh at six o'clock in the morning we sewed him up in his clothes tied a large stone to his feet and having brought all the boats to consigned him in a solemn manner to the ocean this man did not die of absolute starvation although his end was no doubt very much hastened by his sufferings he had a weak and sickly constitution and complained of being unwell the whole voyage it was an incident however which threw a gloom over our feelings for many days in consequence of his death one man from the captain's boat was placed in that from which he died to supply his place and we stood away again on our course on the twelfth of january we had the wind from the northwest which commenced in the morning and came on to blow before night a perfect gale we were obliged to take in all sail and run before the wind flashes of lightning were quick and vivid and the rain came down in cataracts as however the gale blew us fairly on our course and our speed being great during the day we derived i may say even pleasure from the uncomfortableness and the fury of the storm we were apprehensive that in the darkness of this night we should be separated and made arrangements each boat to keep an east southeast course all night about eleven o'clock my boat being ahead a short distance of the others i turned my head back as i was in the habit of doing every minute and neither of the others were to be seen it was blowing and raining all this time as if the heavens were separating and i knew not hardly at the moment what to do i hove my boat to the wind and lay drifting about an hour expecting every moment that they would come up with me but not seeing anything of them i put away again and stood on the course agreed upon with strong hopes that daylight would enable me to discover them again when the morning dawned in vain did we look over every part of the ocean for our companions they were gone and we saw no more of them afterwards 
it was folly to repine at the circumstance it could neither be remedied nor could sorrow secure their return but it was impossible to prevent ourselves feeling all poignancy and bitterness that characterizes the separation of men who have long suffered in each other's company and whose interests and feelings fate had so closely linked together by our observation we separated at latitude thirty two degrees sixteen minutes south longitude one hundred and twelve degrees twenty minutes west for many days after this accident our progress was attended with dull and melancholy reflections we had lost the cheering of each other's faces that which strange as it is we so much required in both our mental and bodily distresses the fourteenth january proved another very squally and rainy day we had now been nineteen days from the island and had only made a distance of about nine hundred miles necessity began to whisper us that a still further reduction in our allowance must take place or we must abandon altogether the hopes of reaching the land and rely wholly on the chance of being taken up by a vessel but how to reduce the daily quantity of food with any regard to life itself was a question of the utmost consequence upon our first leaving the wreck the demands of the stomach had been circumscribed to the smallest possible compass and subsequently before reaching the island a diminution had taken place of nearly one half and it was now from a reasonable calculation become necessary even to curtail that at least one half which must in a short time reduce us to mere skeletons again we had a full allowance of water but it only served to contribute to our debility our bodies deriving but the scant support which an ounce and a half of bread for each man afforded it required a great effort to bring matters to this dreadful alternative either to feed our bodies and our hopes a little longer or in the agonies of hunger to seize upon and devour our provisions and coolly await the approach of death we were as yet just able to move about in our boats and slowly perform the necessary labors appertaining to her but we were fast wasting away with the relaxing effects of the water and we daily almost perished under the torrid rays of a meridian sun to escape which we would lie down in the bottom of the boat cover ourselves over with the sails and abandon her to the mercy of the waves upon attempting to rise again the blood would rush into the head and an intoxicating blindness come over us almost to occasion our sudden falling down again a slight interest was still kept up in our minds by the distant hopes of yet meeting with other boats but it was never realized an accident occurred at night which gave me great cause of uneasiness and led me to an unpleasant rumination upon the probable consequences of a repetition of it i had laid down in the boat without taking the usual precaution of securing the lid of the provision chest as i was accustomed to do when one of the white men awoke me and informed me that one of the blacks had taken some bread from it i felt at the moment the highest indignation and resentment at such conduct in any of our crew and immediately took my pistol in my hand and charged him if he had taken any to give it up without the least hesitation or i should instantly shoot him he became at once very much alarmed and trembling confessed the fact pleading the hard necessity that urged him to it he appeared to be very penitent for his crime and earnestly swore that he would never be guilty of it again i could not find it in my soul to extend towards him the least severity on this account however much according to the strict imposition which we felt upon ourselves it might demand it this was the first infraction and the security of our lives our hopes of redemption from our sufferings loudly called for a prompt and signal punishment but every humane feeling of nature pleaded in his behalf and he was permitted to escape with the solemn injunction that a repetition of the same offence would cost him his life i had almost determined upon this occurrence to divide our provisions and give to each man his share of the whole stock and should have done so in the height of my resentment had it not been for the reflection that some might by imprudence be tempted to go beyond the daily allowance or consume it all at once and bring on a premature weakness or starvation this would of course disable them for the duties of the boat and reduce our chances of safety and deliverance 
on the fifteenth of january at night a very large shark was observed swimming about us in a most ravenous manner making attempts every now and then upon different parts of the boat as if he would devour the very wood with hunger he came several times and snapped at the steering oar and even the stern post we tried in vain to stab him with a lance but we were so weak as not to be able to make any impression upon his hard skin he was so much larger than the ordinary one and manifested such a fearless malignity as to make us afraid of him and our utmost efforts which were at first directed to kill him for prey became in the end self-defence baffled however in all his hungry attempts upon us he shortly made off on the sixteenth of january we were surrounded with porpoises in great numbers that followed us nearly an hour and which also defied all manoeuvres to catch them the seventeenth and eighteenth proved to be calm and the distresses of a cheerless prospect and a burning hot sun were again visited upon our devoted heads we began to think that divine providence had abandoned us at last and it was but an unavailing effort to endeavour to prolong a now tedious existence horrible were the feelings that took possession of us the contemplation of a death of agony and torment refined by the most dreadful and distressing reflections absolutely prostrated both body and soul there was not a hope now remaining to us but that which was derived from a sense of the mercies of our creator the night of the eighteenth was a despairing era in our sufferings our minds were wrought up to the highest pitch of dread and apprehension for our fate and all in them was dark gloomy and confused about eight o'clock the terrible noise of whale spouts near us sounded in our ears we could distinctly hear the furious thrashing of their tails in the water and our weak minds pictured out their appalling and hideous aspects one of my companions the black man took an immediate fright and solicited me to take out the oars and endeavoured to get away from them i consented to his using any means for that purpose but alas it was wholly out of our power to raise a single arm in our own defence two or three of the whales came down near us and went swiftly off across our stern blowing and spouting at a terrible rate they however after an hour or two disappeared and we saw no more of them the next day the nineteenth of january we had extremely boisterous weather with rain heavy thunder and lightning which reduced us again to the necessity of taking in all sail and lying to the wind blew from every point of the compass within the twenty-four hours and at last towards the next morning settled at east northeast a strong breeze january twenty the black man richard peterson manifested to-day symptoms of a speedy dissolution he had been lying between the seats in the boat utterly dispirited and broken down without being able to do the least duty or hardly to place his hand to his head for the last three days and had this morning made up his mind to die rather than endure further misery he refused his allowance said he was sensible of his approaching end and was perfectly ready to die in a few minutes he became speechless the breath appeared to be leaving his body without producing the least pain and at four o'clock he was gone i had two days previously conversations with him on the subject of religion on which he reasoned very sensibly and with much composure and begged me to let his wife know his fate if ever i reached home in safety the next morning we committed him to the sea in latitude thirty five degrees seven minutes south longitude one hundred and five degrees forty six minutes west the wind prevailed to the eastward until the twenty fourth of january when it again fell calm we were now in a most wretched and sinking state of debility hardly able to crawl around the boat and possessing but strength enough to convey our scanty morsels to our mouths when i perceived this morning that it was calm my fortitude almost forsook me i thought to suffer another scorching day like the last we had experienced would close before night the scene of our miseries and i felt many a despairing moment that day that had well nigh proved fatal it required an effort to look calmly forward and contemplate what was yet in store for us beyond what i felt i was capable of making and what it was that buoyed me above all terrors which surrounded us god alone knows 
our ounce and a half of bread which was to serve us all day was in some cases greedily devoured as if life was to continue but another moment and at other times it was hoarded up and eaten crumb by crumb at regular intervals during the day as if it was to last us forever to add to our calamities biles began to break out upon us and our imaginations shortly became as diseased as our bodies i laid down at night to catch a few moments of oblivious sleep and immediately my starving fancy was at work i dreamt of being placed near a splendid and rich repast where there was everything that the most dainty appetite could desire and of contemplating the moment in which we were to commence to eat with enraptured feelings of delight and just as i was about to partake of it i suddenly awoke to the cold realities of my miserable situation nothing could have oppressed me so much it set such a longing frenzy for victuals in my mind that i felt as if i could have wished the dream to continue forever that i never might have awoke from it i cast a sort of vacant stare about the boat until my eyes rested upon a bit of tough cowhide which was fastened to one of the oars i eagerly seized and commenced to chew it but there was no substance in it and it only served to fatigue my weak jaws and add to my bodily pains my fellow sufferers murmured very much the whole time and continued to press me continually with questions upon the probability of our reaching land again i kept constantly rallying my spirits to enable me to afford them comfort i encouraged them to bear up against all evils and if we must perish to die in our own cause and not weakly distrust the providence of the almighty by giving ourselves up to despair i reasoned with them and told them that we would not die sooner by keeping up our hopes that the dreadful sacrifices and privations we endured were to preserve us from death and were not to be put in competition with the price which we set upon our lives and their value to our families it was besides unmanly to repine at what neither admitted of alleviation nor cure and withal it was our solemn duty to recognize in our calamities an overruling divinity at whose mercy we might be suddenly snatched from peril and to rely upon him alone who tempers the wind to the shorn lamb end of section nine End of the Shipwreck of the Whale Ship Essex by Owen Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Chapter 3, Part 7, January 25th to the Conclusion. The three following days, the 25th, 26th, and 27th, were not distinguished by any particular circumstances. The wind still prevailed to the eastward, and by its obduracy, almost tore the very hopes of our hearts away. It was impossible to silence the rebellious repinings of our nature at witnessing such a succession of hard fortune against us. It was our cruel lot not to have had one bright anticipation realized, not one wish of our thirsting souls gratified. We had, at the end of these three days, been urged to the southward, as far as latitude 36 degrees, into a chilly region, where rains and squalls prevailed, and we now calculated to tack and stand back to the northward. After much labor, we got our boat about, and so great was the fatigue attending this small exertion of our bodies, that we all gave up for a moment and abandoned her to her own course not one of us had now strength sufficient to steer or indeed to make one single effort towards getting the sails properly trimmed to enable us to make any headway after an hour or two of relaxation during which the horrors of our situation came upon us with a despairing force and effect we made a sudden effort and got our sails into such a disposition as that the boat would steer herself and we then drew ourselves down awaiting the issue of time to bring us relief or to take us from the scene of our troubles we could now do nothing more strength and spirits were totally gone and what indeed could have been the narrow hopes that in our situation then bound us to life january twenty eighth 
our spirits this morning were hardly sufficient to allow our enjoying a change of the wind which took place to the westward it had nearly become indifferent to us from what quarter it blew nothing but the slight chance of meeting with a vessel remained to us now it was this narrow comfort alone that prevented me from lying down at once to die but fourteen days stinted allowance of provisions remained and it was absolutely necessary to increase the quantity to enable us to live five days longer we therefore partook of it as pinching necessity demanded and gave ourselves wholly up to the guidance and disposal of our creator the twenty ninth and thirtieth of january the wind continued west and we made considerable progress until the thirty first when it again came ahead and prostrated all our hopes on the first of february it changed again to the westward and on the second and third blew to the eastward and we had it light and variable until the eighth of february our sufferings were now drawing to a close a terrible death appeared shortly to await us hunger became violent and outrageous and we prepared for a speedy release from our troubles our speech and reason were both considerably impaired and we were reduced to be at this time certainly the most helpless and wretched of the whole human race isaac cole one of our crew had the day before this in a fit of despair thrown himself down in the boat and was determined there calmly to wait for death it was obvious that he had no chance all was dark he said in his mind not a single ray of hope was left for him to dwell upon and it was folly and madness to be struggling against what appeared so palpably to be our fixed and settled destiny i remonstrated with him as effectually as the weakness of both my body and understanding would allow of and what i said appeared for a moment to have a considerable effect he made a powerful and sudden effort half rose up crawled forward and hoisted the jib and firmly and loudly cried that he would not give up that he would live as long as the rest of us but alas this effort was but the hectic fever of the moment and he shortly again relapsed into a state of melancholy and despair this day his reason was attacked and he became about nine o'clock in the morning a most miserable spectacle of madness he spoke incoherently about everything calling loudly for a napkin and water and then lying stupidly and senselessly down in the boat again and would close his hollow eyes as if in death about ten o'clock we suddenly perceived that he became speechless we got him as well as we were able upon a board placed on one of the seats of the boat and covered him up with some old clothes left him to his fate he lay in the greatest pain and apparent misery groaning piteously until four o'clock when he died in the most horrid and frightful convulsions i ever witnessed we kept his corpse all night and in the morning my two companions began as of course to make preparations to dispose of it in the sea when after reflecting on the subject all night i addressed them on the painful subject of keeping the body for food our provisions could not possibly last beyond three days within which time it was not in any degree probable that we should find relief from our present sufferings and that hunger would at last drive us to the necessity of casting lots it was without any objection agreed to and we set to work as fast as we were able to prepare it so as to prevent it spoiling we separated his limbs from his body and cut all the flesh from the bones after which we opened the body took out the heart and then closed it again sewed it up as decently as we could and committed it to the sea we now first commenced to satisfy the immediate cravings of nature from the heart which we eagerly devoured and then eat sparingly of a few pieces of the flesh after which we hung up the remainder cut in thin strips about the boat to dry in the sun we made a fire and roasted some of it to serve us during the day in this manner did we dispose of our fellow sufferer the painful recollection of which brings to mind at this moment some of the most disagreeable and revolting ideas that it is capable of conceiving we knew not then to whose lot it would fall next either to die or be shot 
and eaten like the poor wretch we had just dispatched humanity must shudder at the dreadful recital i have no language to paint the anguish of our souls in this dreadful dilemma the next morning the tenth of february we found that the flesh had become tainted and had turned of a greenish color upon which we concluded to make a fire and cook it at once to prevent its becoming so putrid not to be eaten at all we accordingly did so and by that means preserved it for six or seven days longer our bread during the time remained untouched as that would not be liable to spoil we placed it carefully aside for the last moments of our trial about three o'clock this afternoon a strong breeze set in from the northwest and we made very good progress considering that we were compelled to steer the boat by management of the sails alone this wind continued until the thirteenth when it changed again ahead we contrived to keep soul and body together by sparingly partaking of our flesh cut up in small pieces and eaten with salt water by the fourteenth our bodies became so far recruited as to enable us to make a few attempts at guiding our boat again with the oar by each taking his turn we managed to effect it and to make a tolerable good course on the fifteenth our flesh was all consumed and we were driven to the last morsel of bread consisting of two cakes our limbs had for the last two days swelled very much and now began to pain us most excessively we were still as near as we could judge three hundred miles from land and but three days of our allowance on hand the hope of a continuation of the wind which came out at west this morning was the only comfort and solace that remained to us so strong had our desires at last reached in this respect that a high fever had set in in our veins and a longing that nothing but its continuation could satisfy matters were now with us at their height all hope was cast upon the breeze and we tremblingly and fearfully awaited its progress and the dreadful development of our destiny on the sixteenth at night full of the horrible reflections of our situation and panting with weakness i laid down to sleep almost indifferent whether i should ever see the light again i had not lain long before i dreamt i saw a ship at some distance off from us and strained every nerve to get to her but could not i awoke almost overpowered with the frenzy i had caught in my slumbers and stung with the cruelties of a diseased and disappointed imagination on the seventeenth in the afternoon a heavy cloud appeared to be settling down in an east by north direction from us which in my view indicated the vicinity of some land which i took for the island of massafuera i concluded it could be no other and immediately upon this reflection the life-blood began to flow again briskly in my veins I told my companions that I was well convinced it was land, and if so, in all probability we should reach it before two days more. My words appeared to comfort them much, and by repeated assurances of the favorable appearance of things, their spirits acquired even a degree of elasticity that was truly astonishing. The dark features of our distress began now to diminish a little, and the countenance, even amid the gloomy bodings of our hard lot to assume a much fresher hue we directed our course for the cloud and our progress that night was extremely good the next morning before daylight thomas nicholson a boy of about seventeen years of age one of my two companions who had thus far survived with me after having bailed the boat laid down drew a piece of canvas over him and cried out that he then wished to die immediately i saw that he had given up and i attempted to speak a few words of comfort and encouragement to him and endeavored to persuade him that it was a great weakness and even wickedness to abandon a reliance upon the almighty while the least hope and a breath of life remained but he felt unwilling to listen to any of the consolatory suggestions which i made to him and notwithstanding the extreme probability which i stated there was of our gaining the land before the end of two days more he insisted upon laying down and giving himself up to despair a fixed look of settled and forsaken despondency came over his face 
he lay for some time silent sullen and sorrowful and i felt at once satisfied that the coldness of death was fast gathering upon him there was a sudden and unaccountable earnestness in his manner that alarmed me and made me fear that i myself might unexpectedly be overtaken by a like weakness or dizziness of nature that would bereave me at once of both reason and life but providence willed it otherwise at about seven o'clock this morning while i was lying asleep my companion who was steering suddenly and loudly called out there's a sail i know not what was the first movement i made upon hearing such an unexpected cry the earliest of my recollections are that immediately i stood up gazing in a state of abstraction and ecstasy upon the blessed vision of a vessel about seven miles off from us she was standing in the same direction with us and the only sensation i felt at the here this copy of chase's book ends but handwritten comments by herman melville bound with this copy conclude thus i cannot tell exactly how many pages the complete narrative contains but at any rate very little remains to be related the boat was picked up by the ship and the two fellows were landed in chile and in time sailed for home owen chase returned to his business of whaling and in some time became a captain as related in the beginning end of section 10 end of a narrative of the most extraordinary and distressing shipwreck of the whale ship essex of nantucket which was attacked and finally destroyed by a large spermaceti whale in the pacific ocean with an account of the unparalleled sufferings of the captain and crew during a space of ninety-three days at sea in open boats in the years eighteen nineteen and eighteen twenty